chapter 12, Abraham in Canaan. This chapter is based on Genesis 13 to 15, chapter 17, 1 through 16, and chapter 18. Abraham returned to Canaan very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Lot was still with him, and again they came to Bethel and pitched their tents by the altar which they had before erected. They soon found that increased possessions brought increased trouble. In the midst of hardships and trials they had dwelt together in harmony, but in their prosperity there was danger of strife between them. The pasturage was not sufficient for the flocks and herds of both, and the frequent disputes among the herdsmen were brought for settlement to their masters. It was evident that they must separate. Abraham was Lot's senior in years, and his superior in relation, in wealth and in position. Yet he was the first to propose plans for preserving peace. Although the whole land had been given him by God himself, he courteously waived this right. Let there be no strife, he said, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Here the noble unselfish spirit of Abraham was displayed. How many under similar circumstances would, at all hazards, cling to their individual rights and preferences? How many households have thus been rent asunder? How many churches have been divided, making the cause of truth a byword and a reproach among the wicked? Let there be no strife between me and thee, said Abraham, for we be brethren. Not only by natural relationship, but as worshippers of the true God. The children of God the world over are one family, and the same spirit of love and conciliation should govern them. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 is the teaching of our Savior. The cultivation of a uniform courtesy, a willingness to do to others as we would wish them to do to us, would annihilate half the ills of life. The spirit of self-aggrandizement is the spirit of Satan, but the heart in which the love of Christ is cherished will possess that charity which seeketh not her own. Such will heed the divine injunction, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 Although Lot owed his prosperity to his connection with Abraham, he manifested no gratitude to his benefactor. Courtesy would have dictated that he yield the choice to Abraham, but instead of this he selfishly endeavored to grasp all its advantages. He lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. The most fertile region in all Palestine was the Jordan Valley, reminding the beholders of the lost paradise and equaling the beauty and productiveness of the Nile-enriched plains they had so lately left. There were cities also, wealthy and beautiful, inviting to profitable traffic in their crowded marts. Dazzled with visions of worldly gain, Lot overlooked the moral and spiritual evils that would be encountered there. The inhabitants of the plain were sinners before the Lord exceedingly, but of this he was ignorant, or, knowing, gave it but little weight. He chose him all the plain of Jordan, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. How little did he foresee the terrible results of that selfish choice! After the separation from Lot, Abraham again received from the Lord a promise of the whole country. Soon after this he removed to Hebron, pitching his tent under the oaks of Mamre, and erecting beside it an altar to the Lord. In the free air of those upland plains, with their olive groves and vineyards, their fields of waving grain, and the wide pasture grounds of the encircling hills, he dwelt well content with his simple patriarchal life, and leaving to Lot the perilous luxury of the Vale of Sodom. 
Abraham was honored by the surrounding nations as a mighty prince and a wise and able chief. He did not shut away his influence from his neighbors. His life and character, in their marked contrast with those of the worshipers of idols, exerted a telling influence in favor of the true faith. His allegiance to God was unswerving, while his affability and benevolence inspired confidence and friendship and his unaffected greatness commanded respect and honor. His religion was not held as a precious treasure to be jealously guarded and enjoyed solely by the possessor. True religion cannot be thus held, for such a spirit is contrary to the principles of the gospel. While Christ is dwelling in the heart, it is impossible to conceal the light of his presence, or for that light to grow dim. On the contrary, it will grow brighter and brighter as day by day the mists of selfishness and sin that envelop the soul are dispelled by the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. The people of God are His representatives upon the earth, and He intends that they should be lights in the moral darkness of this world. Scattered all over the country, in the towns, cities, and villages, they are God's witnesses the channels through which he will communicate to an unbelieving world the knowledge of his will and the wonders of his grace. It is his plan that all who are partakers of the great salvation shall be missionaries for him. The piety of the Christian constitutes the standard by which worldlings judge the gospel. Trials patiently borne, blessings gratefully received, meekness, kindness, mercy, and love habitually exhibited, are the lights that shine forth in the character before the world, revealing the contrast with the darkness that comes of the selfishness of the natural heart. Rich in faith, noble in generosity, unfaltering in obedience, and humble in the simplicity of his pilgrim life, Abraham was also wise in diplomacy and brave and skillful in war. Notwithstanding, he was known as the teacher of a new religion, Three royal brothers, rulers of the Amorite plains in which he dwelt, manifested their friendship by inviting him to enter into an alliance with them for greater security. For the country was filled with violence and oppression. An occasion soon arose for him to avail himself of this alliance. Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, had invaded Canaan fourteen years before and made it tributary to him. Several of the princes now revolted, and the Elamite king with four allies again marched into the country to reduce them to submission. Five kings of Canaan joined their forces and met the invaders in the Vale of Siddim, but only to be completely overthrown. A large part of the army was cut to pieces, and those who escaped fled for safety to the mountains. The victors plundered the cities of the plain and departed with rich spoil and many captives, among whom were Lot and his family. Abraham, dwelling in peace in the oak groves at Mamre, learned from one of the fugitives the story of the battle and the calamity that had befallen his nephew. He had cherished no unkind memory of Lot's ingratitude. All his affection for him was awakened, and he determined that he should be rescued. Seeking first of all divine counsel, Abraham prepared for war. From his own encampment he summoned 318 trained servants, men trained in the fear of God, in the service of their master, and in the practice of arms. His confederates, Mamre, Eshkol, and Aner, joined him with their bands, and together they started in pursuit of the invaders. The Elamites and their allies had encamped at Dan on the northern border of Canaan. Flushed with victory and having no fear of an assault from their vanquished foes, they had given themselves up to reveling. The patriarch divided his force so as to approach from different directions, and came upon the encampment by night. His attack, so vigorous and unexpected, resulted in speedy victory. The king of Elam was slain, and his panic-stricken forces were utterly routed. Lot and his family, with all the prisoners and their goods, were recovered, and a rich booty fell into the hands of the victors. To Abraham, under God, the triumph was due. The worshiper of Jehovah had not only rendered a great service to the country, but had proved himself a man of valor. 
it was seen that righteousness is not cowardice, and that Abraham's religion made him courageous in maintaining the right and defending the oppressed. His heroic act gave him a widespread influence among the surrounding tribes. On his return, the king of Sodom came out with his retinue to honor the conqueror. He bade him take the goods, begging only that the prisoners should be restored. By the usage of war, the spoils belonged to the conquerors. But Abraham had undertaken this expedition with no purpose of gain, and he refused to take advantage of the unfortunate, only stipulating that his confederates should receive the portion to which they were entitled. Few, if subjected to such a test, would have shown themselves as noble as did Abraham. Few would have resisted the temptation to secure so rich a booty. His example is a rebuke to self-seeking, mercenary spirits. Abraham regarded the claims of justice and humanity. His conduct illustrates the inspired maxim, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. I have lifted up my hand, he said, unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. He would give them no occasion to think that he had engaged in warfare for the sake of gain, or to attribute his prosperity to their gifts or favor. God had promised to bless Abraham, and to him the glory should be ascribed. Another who came out to welcome the victorious patriarch was Melchizedek, king of Salem, who brought forth bread and wine for the refreshment of his army. As priest of the Most High God, he pronounced a blessing upon Abraham and gave thanks to the Lord, who had wrought so great a deliverance by his servant. And Abraham gave him tithes of all. Abraham gladly returned to his tents and his flocks, but his mind was disturbed by harassing thoughts. He had been a man of peace, so far as possible shunning enmity and strife, and with horror he recalled the scene of carnage he had witnessed. But the nations whose forces he had defeated would doubtless renew the invasion of Canaan and make him the special object of their vengeance. Becoming thus involved in national quarrels, the peaceful quiet of his life would be broken. Furthermore, he had not entered upon the possession of Canaan, nor could he now hope for an heir to whom the promise might be fulfilled. In a vision of the night, the divine voice was again heard. Fear not, Abraham, were the words of the prince of princes. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. But his mind was so oppressed by forebodings that he could not now grasp the promise with unquestioning confidence as heretofore. He prayed for some tangible evidence that it would be fulfilled. And how was the covenant promise to be realized while the gift of a son was withheld? What wilt thou give me, he said, seeing I go childless? And lo, one born in my house is mine heir, he proposed to make his trusty servant Eliezer his son by adoption and the inheritor of his possessions. But he was assured that a child of his own was to be his heir. Then he was led outside his tent and told to look up to the unnumbered stars glittering in the heavens. And as he did so, the words were spoken, So shall thy seed be. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Still the patriarch begged for some visible token as a confirmation of his faith, and as an evidence to after generations that God's gracious purposes toward them would be accomplished. The Lord condescended to enter into a covenant with his servant, employing such forms as were customary among men for the ratification of a solemn engagement. By divine direction, Abraham sacrificed a heifer, a she-goat, and a ram, each three years old, dividing the bodies and laying the pieces a little distance apart. To these he added a turtle-dove and a young pigeon, which, however, were not divided. This being done, 
he reverently passed between the parts of the sacrifice, making a solemn vow to God of perpetual obedience. Watchful and steadfast, he remained beside the carcasses till the going down of the sun, to guard them from being defiled or devoured by birds of prey. About sunset he sank into a deep sleep, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And the voice of God was heard, bidding him not to expect immediate possession of the promised land, and pointing forward to the sufferings of his posterity before their establishment in Canaan. The plan of redemption was here opened to him, in the death of Christ, the great sacrifice, and his coming in glory. Abraham saw also the earth restored to its Eden beauty, to be given him for an everlasting possession, as the final and complete fulfillment of the promise. As a pledge of this covenant of God with men, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, symbols of the divine presence, passed between the severed victims, totally consuming them. And again a voice was heard by Abraham confirming the gift of the land of Canaan to his descendants, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. When Abraham had been nearly twenty-five years in Canaan, the Lord appeared unto him and said, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. In awe the patriarch fell upon his face, and the message continued, Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. In token of the fulfillment of this covenant, his name, heretofore called Abram, was changed to Abraham, which signifies father of a great multitude. Sarah's name became Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, princess. For, said the divine voice, she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. At this time the rite of circumcision was given to Abraham as a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. Romans chapter 4, verse 11. It was to be observed by the patriarch and his descendants as a token that they were devoted to the service of God and thus separated from idolaters, and that God accepted them as his peculiar treasure. By this rite they were pledged to fulfill on their part the conditions of the covenant made with Abraham. They were not to contract marriages with the heathen, for by so doing they would lose their reverence for God and His holy law. They would be tempted to engage in the sinful practices of other nations and would be seduced into idolatry. God conferred great honor upon Abraham. Angels of heaven walked and talked with him as friend with friend. When judgments were about to be visited upon Sodom, the fact was not hidden from him, and he became an intercessor with God for sinners. His interview with the angels presents also a beautiful example of hospitality. In the hot summer noontide, the patriarch was sitting in his tent door, looking out over the quiet landscape, when he saw in the distance three travelers approaching. Before reaching his tent, the travelers halted, as if consulting as to their course. Without waiting for them to solicit favors, Abraham rose quickly, and as they were apparently turning in another direction, he hastened after them, and with the utmost courtesy urged them to honor him by tarrying for refreshment. With his own hands he brought water that they might wash the dust of travel from their feet. He himself selected their food, and while they were at rest under the cooling shade, an entertainment was made ready, and he stood respectfully beside them while they partook of his hospitality. This act of courtesy God regarded of sufficient importance to record in His Word, and a thousand years later it was referred to by an inspired apostle, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 Abraham had seen in his guests only three tired wayfarers, little thinking that among them was one whom he might worship without sin. But the true character of the heavenly messengers was now revealed. Though they were on their way as ministers of wrath, yet to Abraham, the man of faith, they spoke first of blessings. Though God is strict to mark iniquity and to punish transgression, 
he takes no delight in vengeance. The work of destruction is a strange work to him who is infinite in love. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Psalm 25, verse 14. Abraham had honored God, and the Lord honored him, taking him into his counsels and revealing to him his purposes. Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, said the Lord? The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. God knew well the measure of Sodom's guilt, but he expressed himself after the manner of men, that the justice of his dealings might be understood. Before bringing judgment upon the transgressors, he would go himself to institute an examination of their course. If they had not passed the limits of divine mercy, he would still grant them space for repentance. Two of the heavenly messengers departed, leaving Abraham alone with him, whom he now knew to be the Son of God. And the man of faith pleaded for the inhabitants of Sodom. Once he had saved them by his sword, now he endeavored to save them by prayer. Lot and his household were still dwellers there, and the unselfish love that prompted Abraham to their rescue from the Elamites now sought to save them, if it were God's will, from the storm of divine judgment. With deep reverence and humility he urged his plea, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. There was no self-confidence, no boasting of his own righteousness. He did not claim favor on the ground of his obedience or of the sacrifices he had made in doing God's will. Himself a sinner, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf. Such a spirit all who approach God should possess. Yet Abraham manifested the confidence of a child pleading with the loved father. He came close to the heavenly messenger and fervently urged his petition. Though Lot had become a dweller in Sodom, he did not partake in the iniquity of its inhabitants. Abraham thought that in that populous city there must be other worshippers of the true God. And in view of this he pleaded, That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham asked not once merely, but many times. Waxing bolder as his requests were granted, he continued until he gained the assurance that if even ten righteous persons should be found in it, the city would be spared. Love for perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer. While he loathed the sins of that corrupt city, he desired that the sinners might be saved. His deep interest for Sodom shows the anxiety that we should feel for the impenitent. We should cherish hatred of sin, but pity and love for the sinner. All around us are souls going down to ruin as hopeless, as terrible, as that which befell Sodom. Every day the probation of some is closing. Every hour some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. And where are the voices of warning and entreaty to bid the sinner flee from this fearful doom? Where are the hands stretched out to draw him back from death? Where are those who with humility and persevering faith are pleading with God for him? The spirit of Abraham was the spirit of Christ. The Son of God is himself the great intercessor in the sinner's behalf. He who has paid the price for its redemption knows the worth of the human soul. With an antagonism to evil such as can exist only in a nature, spotlessly pure, Christ manifested toward the sinner a love which infinite goodness alone could conceive. In the agonies of the crucifixion, himself burdened with the awful weight of the sins of the whole world, he prayed for his revilers and murderers, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Of Abraham it is written that he was called the friend of God, the father of all them that believe. James chapter 2, verse 23, and Romans chapter 4, verse 11. The testimony of God concerning this faithful patriarch is, 
Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And again, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. It was a high honor to which Abraham was called, that of being the father of the people who for centuries were the guardians and preservers of the truth of God for the world, of that people through whom all the nations of the earth should be blessed in the advent of the promised Messiah. But he who called the patriarch judged him worthy. It is God that speaks. He who understands the thoughts afar off and places the right estimate upon men says, I know him. There would be on the part of Abraham no betraying of the truth for selfish purposes. He would keep the law and deal justly and righteously, and he would not only fear the Lord himself, but would cultivate religion in his home. He would instruct his family in righteousness. The law of God would be the rule in his household. Abraham's household comprised more than a thousand souls. Those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God found a home in his encampment, and here, as in a school, they received such instruction as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. Thus a great responsibility rested upon him. He was training heads of families, and his methods of government would be carried out in the households over which they should preside. In early times, the father was the ruler and the priest of his own family, and he exercised authority over his children, even after they had families of their own. His descendants were taught to look up to him as their head, in both religious and secular matters. This patriarchal system of government Abraham endeavored to perpetuate, as it tended to preserve the knowledge of God. It was necessary to bind the members of the household together, in order to build up a barrier against the idolatry that had become so widespread and so deep-seated. Abraham sought by every means in his power to guard the inmates of his encampment against mingling with the heathen and witnessing their idolatrous practices, for he knew that familiarity with evil would insensibly corrupt the principles. The greatest care was exercised to shut out every form of false religion and to impress the mind with the majesty and the glory of the living God as the true object of worship. It was a wise arrangement which God himself had made to cut off his people so far as possible from connection with the heathen, making them a people dwelling alone and not reckoned among the nations. He had separated Abraham from his idolatrous kindred, that the patriarch might train and educate his family apart from the seductive influences which would have surrounded them in Mesopotamia, and that the true faith might be preserved in its purity by his descendants from generation to generation. Abraham's affection for his children and his household led him to guard their religious faith, to impart to them a knowledge of the divine statutes, as the most precious legacy he could transmit to them, and through them to the world. All were taught that they were under the rule of the God of heaven. There was to be no oppression on the part of parents, and no disobedience on the part of children. God's law had appointed to each his duties, and only in obedience to it could any secure happiness or prosperity. His own example the silent influence of his daily life was a constant lesson. The unswerving integrity, the benevolence and unselfish courtesy which had won the admiration of kings were displayed in the home. There was a fragrance about the life, a nobility and loveliness of character which revealed to all that he was connected with heaven. He did not neglect the soul of the humblest servant, in his household there was not one law for the master and another for the servant, a royal way for the rich and another for the poor. All were treated with justice and compassion as inheritors with him of the grace of life. He will command his household. 
there would be no sinful neglect to restrain the evil propensities of his children, no weak, unwise, indulgent favoritism, no yielding of his conviction of duty to the claims of mistaken affection. Abraham would not only give right instruction, but he would maintain the authority of just and righteous laws. How few there are in our day who follow this example. On the part of too many parents, there is a blind and selfish sentimentalism, miscalled love, which is manifested in leaving children, with their unformed judgment and undisciplined passions, to the control of their own will. This is the veriest cruelty to the youth, and a great wrong to the world. Parental indulgence causes dishonor in families and in society. It confirms in the young the desire to follow inclination, instead of submitting to the divine requirements. Thus they grow up with a heart averse to doing God's will, and they transmit their irreligious, insubordinate spirit to their children and children's children. Like Abraham, parents should command their households after them. Let obedience to parental authority be taught and enforced as the first step in obedience to the authority of God. The light esteem in which the law of God is held, even by religious leaders, has been productive of great evil. The teaching which has become so widespread that the divine statutes are no longer binding upon men is the same as idolatry in its effect upon the morals of the people. Those who seek to lessen the claims of God's holy law are striking directly at the foundation of the government of families and nations. Religious parents, failing to walk in His statutes, do not command their household to keep the way of the Lord. The law of God is not made the rule of life. The children, as they make homes of their own, feel under no obligation to teach their children what they themselves have never been taught. And this is why there are so many godless families. This is why depravity is so deep and widespread. Not until parents themselves walk in the law of the Lord with perfect hearts will they be prepared to command their children after them. A reformation in this respect is needed, a reformation which shall be deep and broad. Parents need to reform. Ministers need to reform. They need God in their households. If they would see a different state of things, they must bring His Word into their families and must make it their counselor. They must teach their children that it is the voice of God addressed to them, and it is to be implicitly obeyed. They should patiently instruct their children, kindly and untiringly teach them how to live in order to please God. The children of such a household are prepared to meet the sophistries of infidelity. They have accepted the Bible as the basis of their faith, and they have a foundation that cannot be swept away by the incoming tide of skepticism. In too many households, prayer is neglected. Parents feel that they have no time for morning and evening worship. They cannot spare a few moments to be spent in thanksgiving to God for His abundant mercies, for the blessed sunshine and the showers of rain which cause vegetation to flourish, and for the guardianship of holy angels. They have no time to offer prayer for divine help and guidance, and for the abiding presence of Jesus in the household. They go forth to labor as the ox or the horse goes, without one thought of God or heaven. They have souls so precious that rather than permit them to be hopelessly lost, the Son of God gave His life to ransom them but they have little more appreciation of His great goodness than have the beasts that perish. Like the patriarchs of old, those who profess to love God should erect an altar to the Lord wherever they pitch their tent. If ever there was a time when every house should be a house of prayer, it is now. Fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication for themselves and their children. Let the Father, as priest of the household, lay upon the altar of God the morning and evening sacrifice, while the wife and children unite in prayer and praise. In such a household Jesus will love to tarry. 
from every Christian home, a holy light should shine forth. Love should be revealed in action. It should flow out in all home intercourse, showing itself in thoughtful kindness, in gentle, unselfish courtesy. There are homes where this principle is carried out, homes where God is worshipped, and truest love reigns. From these homes, morning and evening prayer ascends to God as sweet incense, and His mercies and blessings descend upon the suppliants like the morning dew. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. All can see that there is an influence at work in the family that affects the children, and that the God of Abraham is with them. If the homes of professed Christians had a right religious mold, they would exert a mighty influence for good. They would indeed be the light of the world. The God of heaven speaks to every faithful parent in the words addressed to Abraham, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him.